Welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Hoodies are great for two things. All year round style and making you look like you're finna about to rob the place. So when someone walks in with a hoodie to order some coffee here, I just tell them they've got something on their head. It catches them off guard, and when they end up taking off the hood, at the very least, I get to see just how beautiful they are before they shank me. That reminds me, I've got some new and scary work stories to share with you today, which feature sinister hooded figures and unexplainable occurrences. Prepare your double espresso and get comfy. These are tales from the break room. Dairy Factory Ghosts from Roadrunner. I'm a 23-year-old female forklift driver for a well-known dairy company in Southern Texas. I've been working there for about a year, and my two male coworkers from my section had been working there for 10 years and four years respectively. I'll call them A and K. Now, usually I'm well put together and I have a good head on my shoulders. I don't tend to frighten easily, so the first story kind of will give you an idea of what I was feeling. So let's get into it. My first week working at the factory, A and K proceeded to tell me all the history of the factory before its time as a dairy factory. It had apparently been a manufacturing plant of some sort. Eventually it went bankrupt or closed. To give you a layout of the place, the plant isn't very big. There are a lot of levels, including one where all the electronics, generators, and stuff like that are, which is now mostly for storage. A proceeded to tell me about how a woman who had been working at the plant for 15 years, who was losing her job, proceeded to hang herself off the rails that were around the upper level right over the raising door to the production floor. Kay told me that sometimes on the weekends, when he was there and pretty much alone at the plant, he would often hear footsteps on the catwalk. He would also sometimes feel sad out of nowhere when he was alone in the production room. He said it was like a cloud of despair just settled over the area. One day I was talking to a manager who had been at the factory for 35 years. I asked if anyone had died here just out of curiosity. I was surprised when he said yes. About 15 years ago, an older gentleman had a heart attack, and apparently he fell into the pusher that helps load crate stacks onto the trailer ramp. Basically, it crushed him. It was really just bad luck that he happened to land where he did. I felt sad at the idea of someone dying so horribly like that. My boss, reading my face, put a hand on my shoulder and said, I know it sucks, but if it's any consolation, you might get to say hi to him if you're around at night long enough. I gave him a wide-eyed, puzzled look, and my boss simply grinned and walked away. He would have no idea that it wouldn't be very long before that actually happened. Now, to describe my position, I basically unload and load trailers and I pick up orders, sending them down on the chains for the palletizer to wrap. Sometimes I have to come in on my days off. I come in and unload cardboard trailers to help out production. Well, I got there one day around 7 p.m. to meet with my yard dog, who's the one who puts the trailers in the loading bay for me. Around that time, it was pitch black outside. I have to go hunt for the trailer with that cardboard on it. So there I was, struggling to find this specific trailer in an entire yard with 50 of them. The street lights, combined with my flashlight, could barely chase away the shadows around the parking lot. Finally, I found the correct numbered trailer and proceeded around back. The street lights are next to the trailer since it's backed up all the way to the edge and over the ditch slope, which was nice but I soon noticed the light was just out of reach to shine all the way into this one. So I carefully made my way to the trailer door and unlatched the door. I opened it, making sure it was correct, and I radioed my yard dog to come get it for me. I closed the doors and to my right, I saw a man standing there. My heart leapt in my chest 
and I yelped in surprise, nearly falling down the hill. I caught myself on the guy's jacket sleeve, and I steadied myself, letting out an exasperated sigh. Holy mackerel, you nearly caused me to take a mud bath. Say something next time, will ya? I say, my eyebrow raised in a mock scowl. I take stock of him. He seemed to be around 45 to 50 years old. He had sandy blonde hair and stood around 5 foot 10, with dimples and a scruffy beard. He wore the same uniform as me, just older. He smiled and said, Sorry. His voice sounded gravelly like he was a smoker. I smiled back and replied, Oh, it's fine. I should have been checking around. You never know when something might sneak up on you and bite you. I looked over to the trailer and I made sure the door was locked. And when I looked back, the man was gone. I thought I could hear footsteps going down the path between the two trailers towards the front. Hey, wait up! I called out, jogging towards the way he seemed to have gone. I popped out on the other side, and I quickly looked around for the old man. Where'd he go? I thought, trying to process what happened. I never did get his name. The yard dog pulls up then and starts connecting my trailer. I walked over to him and I said, Did you see anyone walking this way? He shook his head side to side. I frowned. I finished my work and went home, utterly confused. The following day, I made sure to ask A about the guy. To my surprise, A didn't seem to know who I was talking about. I went over to the aforementioned manager, making sure to describe the guy so it would be easier to identify him. My boss laughed and said, well, if I didn't know any better, that does sound like Jared, the resident ghost. I frowned. No, I, I put my hand on him and he felt solid to me, I protested. Well, that's nothing shocking. They can touch you if they are feeling strong enough, but I'm guessing he had a lot of energy from your meeting to allow that. My boss answered nonchalant and went back to work like it was nothing. But wait a minute, I called out. Is he that older guy you said was crushed? I is he mean? I asked, very serious. My manager smiled back. Yes, that's the guy. And no, he's a kind soul, just like how he was in life. I had a sad smile still as I set off back to my area. From then on, I would see if I could get some more meetings with Jared. But so far... All I get is the occasional crate movement or papers that occasionally move or get tossed. If it's him, I don't think he's doing it to be mean. I think he's just wanting to be noticed. I hope he didn't use all his strength just to help me when I almost fell. I'll be kind and talk to him when I find myself alone in the area or outside. Who knows, maybe he will appear again. Till then, thank you for listening. When I drop things, they disappear. I have some glitch in the matrix stories, like a lot. Things going missing just to appear in obvious places. Also, if I drop something and don't watch where it falls to, it just seems to bloop out of existence. The first time this happened to me, I was working at PetSmart. For some background, I worked in pet care. This means that every animal the store has to sell is my responsibility to take care of. Cleaning enclosures, feeding the animals, administrating medicine for the sick babies, these are just a few of the tasks I had to do. Well, one day, while I was scooping the fish who had expired from the tanks, something really weird happened. I was pulling an electric blue Johanni cichlid Keep in mind, there was one live one, and one not so alive, in the tank. I dropped it into the bag I had, only looking at it to aim, and then I went back to scanning the tanks. This was one of the first pulls of the day, and the bags are clear. I look down as I'm putting another fish in the bag, 
and I noticed the previous cichlid is gone. I looked all over the floor. I searched the surrounding tanks, the tank I got him from too, and I even moved the giant bags of gravel out from under the tanks to look for it. No dice. So I asked my coworker to help me look, and they couldn't find it either. That fish never showed up again. It very much unsettled me, but I let it go. The next example I can think of happened actually about a month ago. I lay in bed, and my wife said she wanted to light some incense. I reached over to my bedside table. I pulled out a lighter for her to use. She gave it back to me a few minutes later, and I went to put it up, but it slipped out of my hands. I watched it hit the concrete floor, and it bounced right underneath my bed. Immediately, I went down to start looking for it, but as I peered under my bed, it was gone. I couldn't find it at all. Not under my bed, not on or in my nightstand. Nowhere. I even had my wife help me look for it, and she couldn't find it either. It was my favorite lighter too. My last example of dropping things happened when I was a teenager. It was icy outside one day. I slipped down some stairs. My wallet was in my back pocket at the top of the stairs. I know because I always double check for my wallet before I leave anywhere. But when I hit the bottom, my wallet was gone. Once again, I looked all over the place. It was my wallet after all. I even got someone else to look with me, but it was just gone. On a different note, it was 2019 and my wife and I watched these two movies that she was super excited to show me. They were Odd Thomas and John Dies at the End. I loved those movies, but I didn't think much about them for quite some time. Fast forward to mid-2021. I re-watched these movies at my dad's house. I called my wife because one of the characters had a really cute shirt that I wanted her to crochet for me. As we were talking, my wife asked me how I found that movie. Confused, I told her that she showed me both of these movies at the same time years ago. She was adamant that she had never seen nor heard of them before. We argued about it, but I let it go. Later on, I did make her watch the movies again, with me, and she was totally into them. But she was persistent that she had never seen either of those movies ever before. Now, I may not have the best memory, but how did I know these movies if she didn't show me? I clearly remember the first time I watched them was with her. Well, those are some of the more notable glitches that have happened to me. Honestly, while they can be inconvenient, I kind of love it. Triggering Fight or Flight From K4 This happened years ago, around when I was 19, give or take. I'm from Idaho. I worked at a local Fred Meyer, Kroger at the time. I had the worst boss in the world, but that's a horror story all on its own. This boss, air quotes because he wasn't much of a leader, more or less a boss, just a sexist jerk, put me on freight crew over the holidays as an attempt to get me to quit. But it didn't work. Now, I'm a tall girl, and I wasn't very big. I was also one of the few females to work overnight shifts, as it was primarily men, whose favorite vegetable was jazz cabbage, and they had questionable taste in music. Most nights, the crew would show up at 11 p.m. and start working. This night wasn't much different. The plan was the same. Leave my boyfriend's house, go to work, avoid people at all costs, and go home. Since there were so few people on the cruise, we were all very familiar with each other's vehicles and the direction they'd arrive in. That night would turn out to be different, though. As I drove into work, I noticed a vehicle pull out of one of the warehouse back roads behind me. It was a white Escalade with blacked out windows. It was a little strange to me, but I didn't give it much thought. 
thinking they were just going to turn at the next intersection. You would either turn to get to the main road or go straight into the employee parking area for my warehouse. But they didn't turn. I watched the vehicle in my mirror, waiting to see them separate from behind my vehicle, but they never did. I pulled into the parking area, still watching to see if they were following me. Sure enough, they were. I pulled into the area of the parking lot the security camera usually faced, and I parked there. I was a little early to work, so no one else was around at the moment, but they should be there any time. Still watching that escalate, I saw them maneuver their vehicle the same way and park next to me. In fact, they parked so close, I would have to smash myself between my car and car door to get out. Everything in my body was telling me this was not a safe or right situation. My fight or flight mode had kicked in. I looked straight in front of me for a moment into the empty parking lot, took a breath, and reached into my center console. Now, because I was working freight, I had started carrying a small compact Walther PK-380 as protection. Was I ready to shoot someone? I thought. Could I even squeeze the trigger? Apps of freaking lootly. Me against them, I wrapped my fingers around the gun, the light in my car on. I looked to my left at the white Escalade and lifted my right hand out of the console. I continued to look into the black windows of the Escalade. I looked forward once more, my hand on the dashboard, then looked over to the SUV again, as if to say I was ready for anything. I'd never been more ready. No one was going to hurt me. No one was going to mess with me without getting hurt themselves. I was not about to be a victim, especially not an easy victim. It was after that moment that felt like eternity. I heard their engines start back up. I watched their tires roll forward, and eventually their taillights grew smaller and smaller until they were gone. Now, being 19 and an idiot, I never asked to see the security footage of the lot, and I never did call the cops. I was just grateful I wasn't hurt. I was grateful I didn't have to squeeze the trigger. Of course, I told my boyfriend, because I was brave in my mind, and though I still believe I was, I do think I was a moron. Be safe, and be aware. Parking Lot Chase From Spectre Fox These details may seem random, but they are important. For being 17 years old, I was a pretty stocky guy for my age. I was about 5 foot 9 and played rugby. I used to do martial arts before I joined a team. All those details aside, let's get into the story. I had been working at one of the shops in the mall for about 5 weeks. Now, this mall is near the downtown area where I live. It's gotten worse since 2015. There's also a decent amount of out-of-state people who do come around. That night, it was around 8.15 p.m. I finally got off of my shift. At that point, the mall is empty as it closes early. The only people left are workers from the shops. As for the layout, there's an entrance and exit that's down another section of the mall. This is on the opposite end from the main entrance. This one leads near one of the parking lots by the bookstore, as well as small food stands. By then, a lot of the mall lights were dimmed, and the shops are closed. As I'm walking down, getting ready to leave the exit, I saw a man wearing dark clothes with a very small backpack. He immediately noticed me, and took off, disappearing. I didn't think much of it then, so I opened the door and began to walk away. Soon, I saw the same man emerge, and he began to stare at me again. He then turned back around and started to follow this lady to her car, which was farther out in the parking lot. I started to walk that way to get a better look. He looked back at me again and started to jog into the lot. I began to pick up some speed too, as it's a really big parking lot. 
I saw that he was following this woman, getting closer and closer to her. When she noticed, the woman began to run as fast as she could to her car. At that point, I'd caught up pretty quickly to the creep, and I yelled out, What is your problem? Right away, he stopped and turned around. I'd caught him a bit off guard, apparently, which allowed the woman to make it to her car. I could see that she was crying. She noticed me there and saw the creep running away now. She yelled thank you from her window as she tried to calm herself down. I started to run back to the mall as my jeep was in one of those small side lots by the bookstore. As I was coming back over, two guys came over and asked me if I would seen a man. They gave me a brief description and I said yes, telling him that I saw him stalking this woman to her car. One of the guys said how earlier in the day, they noticed the creep was following them around the mall. They tried going different directions, but he was always there. It got to the point they hung around in a crowded store, which finally allowed them to escape. They had no idea where he ended up and why he had been stalking people that day. During this entire time, my chest felt heavy, like someone ripped my ribs apart and shoved them back together. I then had that pit feeling in my stomach. I'll never know what that man wanted, but I know for sure it was something very disturbing. As for the lady and two guys who got hunted down, I'm sorry that happened. I can't imagine the paranoia. To the creep who did this, I hope you never come back. Filling Her Shoes From Janelle H. In nonprofit work, the hours are typically long, and the work can be very hard. It can be rewarding to work with others to try to make the world a better place, but often employees at nonprofit agencies wind up sacrificing their own personal lives and families for the greater good. Early in my career, over Christmas, my husband and I relocated to a large city right after we got married. He was able to find work fairly easily but I wound up working part-time while I continued the job search. I'd sent resumes to every agency with an opening, and even quite a few who had nothing posted, just trying to get my foot in the door. In March, as part of my part-time role, I attended a volunteer fair, and while I was there, I ended up talking with a volunteer manager from my dream agency. As we talked, she mentioned there might be a position posted later that week for my dream job. Excited about the possibilities, I obsessively checked for the posting, but saw nothing. Not wanting to miss this opportunity, I sent in a resume and cover letter, but sadly I heard nothing back, so I gave up. Months later, in June, I came across a posting the agency had made for a similar job. I almost didn't apply as I was young and figured they would have contacted me before if they were interested in me. My husband encouraged me to try again though, so I did. And, wouldn't you know it, I was called in for an interview. Things went great, and I was hired in July. When I arrived for my first day, my boss was very warm and welcoming, but I noticed several other employees seemed to avoid me or act uncomfortable. My boss seemed to sense it as well, but didn't mention anything. My office was clean and tidy, even having a welcoming card and plant on my desk. It did seem a little weird as in my previous jobs, I had always inherited a lot of files and clutter, typically scavenged in non-profit offices where supplies can be limited. As my boss helped me settle in, I mentioned how nice the office was, and she told me it used to be her own. She had been promoted and moved down the hall, so that made sense. I logged into my computer and saw that my boss had sent out an email to all the existing volunteers introducing me. I started to receive welcoming replies, but then a long email hit my inbox, knocking the breath out of me. The volunteer started her email by saying she'd hoped to never meet me and was disappointed I'd been hired. She cc'd all the other volunteers plus several board members and executive staff, demanding I be terminated 
and my boss tendered her resignation. She threatened to stop her own support of the organization entirely, both with her time and as a donor. In conclusion, she wanted the contact information for the agency national headquarters to file a complaint and call for the local agency's executive director to be removed if I was not terminated immediately. I was devastated, having been on the job for less than an hour and having no idea who this volunteer was or what the heck was happening. I made my way down the hall to my boss's office. As I shambled in, stunned, it was clear my boss had already read the email. She looked at me sheepishly and said she supposed we needed to talk. Apparently, the woman who had previously filled my job, Sarah Ann, had worked for the agency since before most of the staff could remember. Eligible to retire the previous year, she had decided to stay on one more year. As the agency offered the bulk of their programs for kids in the summer, spring was usually the season for lots of long, hard hours in planning and recruiting. Working late one night in March, Sarah Ann was the last in the office. She finished up, set the alarm for the building around 11 p.m., but then never made it home. She was found the next day, deceased in her vehicle from a massive heart attack. Sarah Ann had basically worked herself to death and died almost on the job due to her devotion and passion for the mission. She became an almost mythic figure in an organization that already valued a martyr complex among the staff and volunteers. According to my boss, the office began receiving resumes and job inquiries about the position later that day as news spread of her death. My boss confessed to shredding all the unread resumes she received from these vultures, which I did not confess included me after my initial conversation with her coworker at that volunteer fair in the spring. There was much controversy about replacing Sarah Ann, with some people feeling it was disrespectful to even try. While volunteers and staff pulled together to pull off the final plans for the summer, by June it was clear that it was not a long-term solution, so I'd been hired. Though my boss had been promoted, the real reason she had switched offices with me was that volunteers made a habit of storming in and releasing their frustrations on anyone who they perceived was violating Sarah Ann's space. My boss moved herself into that office so she could deal with the brunt of their frustration and anger. She hoped sending out the group email would make things easier, but my boss went on to tell me the author of the lengthy email had been one of Sarah Ann's most devoted volunteers. She assured me my job was not at risk, that the ire and anger had nothing to do with me, and that she hoped I would stay on despite the circumstances. I did stay on, and I made it through implementing the Ghost of Sarah Ann's summer programs. Some volunteers chose to resign, as their pain was too much, but others stepped in to fill the gaps. Sarah Ann's best friend at the office, Shelley, made a special point to welcome me and support me in staff meetings and with the volunteers. When I confessed to worrying about failing to fill Sarah Ann's shoes, Shelley and my boss both brought the mythic figure down to earth. Sarah Ann had not been perfect, and her workaholic tendencies contributed to her separation from her husband and the distance she had with her own children. They also thought it contributed to her death, and she did not take care of herself and was known to cancel doctor's appointments, procedures, and vacations for the good of the cause. Late in October, I was working one night after a meeting with volunteers. My husband had gotten used to me keeping weird hours as I constantly felt like I was playing catch up to work on plans for the coming year. My phone would ring off the hook and it was nothing for me to walk away with all messages clear, then come back from a 30 minute meeting with the voicemail box full. It was close to 11 p.m. before I could get all the volunteers out the door and start locking up. I went back to my office to finish up one final thing and get the alarm code when I noticed the phone flashing with a single missed call. Knowing this was a rarity and hoping to get ahead for the next day, I decided to listen to the message. I put it on speaker and the words echoed through the empty offices and hallways. 
Hi, hon. This is Sarah Ann. I wanted to let you know how much I appreciate your hard work and efforts to keep all these programs running for the kids. But it is getting late, and it's time to head home now. I just wanted to say thank you. Don't forget to take care of yourself. Have a good evening. A shiver ran down my spine as I grabbed my purse and practically ran out the door. When I got to the car, I realized I had not set the alarm, but I wasn't going back. When I got home, I collapsed in my husband's arms, crying from exhaustion, anxiety, or fear, maybe all three. The next day, I confessed to my boss that I was the one who left the alarm off and tried to pull up the message so she could listen to it. But that message was gone. I guess the system deleted it after playing it. I don't remember hanging up from the speakerphone or exiting out of the voicemail. I don't know how long that message was floating in the system before it was delivered to me that night, or who it was originally intended for, if not me. I want to believe she made that last call before locking up and heading out that late night back in March, already feeling a little off as she stepped through the office doors that last time. As for me, I continued to work at that agency another five years before moving on to other nonprofit opportunities. It's been 20 years now, and I got better at setting boundaries and expectations. While I still have an occasional evening meeting, we're all headed home before 9 p.m. I also practice and encourage self-care and vacations. We work hard to serve the community, but our employees and their families are part of the world we're trying to improve. While I appreciate and honor Sarah Ann's work, those are shoes I've decided not to fill. A job not quite right for me. From R.D. The following story is from about 16 years ago, from when I had just finished university and I was looking for pretty much any sort of job while living with my then-girlfriend at the time. I live in Hull, in the northeast of England. It is known to have a fair bit of paranormal activity. Just outside the Wold Newton Triangle, in East Yorkshire, which has anything from UFOs to fairies to dogmen and a literal screaming skull, Hull has its own share of hauntings along many of the bridges, pubs, and hotels and shopping centers of the city. I've always been sensitive to this sort of thing, to the extent where I used to take the long route to university, walking the extra five to 10 minutes rather than the shortest route, which went past one of the most haunted properties in the UK, which unfortunately was just down the street from where I lived at the time. It was this sort of feeling the gut instinct of wrongness that served me well in the following story. Fresh out of university, I found myself having applied to and been chosen to do a standard see how it is sort of day for one of the larger health and beauty retail stores. This was located in one of the larger shopping centers of the city. It wasn't a great job. It was a very early morning shift from about 3 a.m. to about 7 a.m. I would restock shelves, clean up the shop floor, and get it ready for opening at 7. By all accounts, it was an easy, peaceful job, where no customers would bother me and nothing was too taxing. Well, apart from the general atmosphere of the place. I showed up ridiculously early that morning, having arrived in a taxi wearing the mandatory staff t-shirt and I was given the five-minute walk around of the shop floor. They told me where the trolleys and carts with the stock were, and basically what to do and how to do it. After that, the shift manager left me to my own devices and went into the back to handle deliveries and the like. Now, as you would expect, it was quiet. No irritating music, no noise from people or animals, nothing really. Not that you would expect any sorts of noise or background noise from an empty shopping center in the dead hours of the morning. But as time went on, as I unpacked stock and almost methodically just stacked the shelves with it, 
This sense of quietness became more and more awkward and uneasy. After about an hour, it had gone from just being uncomfortable to being almost eerie. It felt wrong, so very wrong. You know that gut feeling you get? The same feeling that most ghost stories describe when everything goes dead silent and it just feels off. Well, right there at that moment, after about an hour in the store, it felt off. It wasn't just quiet anymore, it was unnaturally quiet. But that wasn't all. It had gotten cold, bitterly cold in fact, to the point where I had to put my jacket back on and I was rubbing my arms, trying to figure out where this sudden chill had come from. It was the middle of summer. Sure, mornings can be a bit nippy, not exactly warm, but this, this felt like midwinter in terms of chill and it seemed to just creep in along with that silence. Now, the shopping center does have a sort of air conditioning setup, but it doesn't work too well. In the heat of the day, it doesn't accomplish much, and in the worst days, it just serves to blow around the soupy air of a bunch of people being far too hot in summer. So now I'm sat there, awkwardly on my knees, glancing about. The store's atmosphere had gone from just quiet and empty to something else entirely. Something that felt both unnatural and hostile. The silence had gone from peaceful to almost smothering, and the air had gotten uncomfortably, bitterly cold. At first, I thought maybe it was an issue with the shopping center's air conditioner and the particular vent I was under. So I moved on. I found new stock to shelf, pulling forward what wasn't being restocked. But that smothering silence and chill seemed to follow me. After a few moments, I started to hear footsteps. I glanced about, trying to see if anyone else was around. But it was just me and the manager. After the third time hearing these footsteps, which grew louder and louder and louder, almost sounding squelchy like wet shoes, I stopped and went toward the back leaning around to call out and ask the manager if everything was okay, to see if there was a problem. Of course, they didn't seem to be phased at all, but they did say they hadn't been to the front for a while, which made the footsteps all the more odd. I tried to calm myself, to get past that rising uneasy feeling and go back to work, but it lingered, the chill constant, the silence constant, Everything was overwhelming, but the worst bit was when I moved along from one area of shelf to the next, shuffling on my knees, I found myself in a pool of water. Now, there had been nothing there before. I didn't have a drink on the shop floor. I wasn't stocking cold drinks in that particular area, but it very much felt like water, cold and seeping into the fabric of my jeans, uncomfortably so. At that point, I stopped and stood. Then I heard the footsteps again, squelching almost directly behind me. I decided then that no, I was not sticking around for this job. I went to the back and spoke to the manager, apologizing, handing the work shirt over and explaining that the job just didn't sit right with me. I didn't mention exactly why. I doubted that the manager or indeed the job center would treat smothering silence an unnatural chill and puddles of water just appearing when there was none as valid cause for not taking the job. I quickly left, making my way back home to collapse and catch up on lost sheep, chilled to the bone and put off by the entire experience. It was only a few weeks later when I decided to, out of curiosity, look into the history of the shopping center that I learned a few particularly disturbing things. The shopping center itself had a number of unfortunate incidents associated with it. Being built on an old dock site, there were several incidents of people falling in and drowning or being dumped into the water. There had also been a number of incidents involving people taking their own lives into the water. Thinking on that, knowing the history and the fact that the shopping center itself was considered active made the incident all the more creepy. 
Sometimes it's not so much the case that you're not quite right for the job, so much as the job is just not quite right for you. And when your gut instinct is telling you that something isn't quite right, listen to it. That's the best advice I can give you. I almost got us killed. From Matt. I work in finance. A pretty boring job, actually. I started working as a teller at a bank in 2016, when I was 20 years old. I grew to know about the pains that customer-facing employees face every day. So be nice to the bank tellers. Their job is extremely difficult. I'd worked there for about a year and a half when one of the darkest experiences of my life happened. I had promoted up to be a loan officer and had my own office by the back door. It was great because my boss was chill and I would mostly watch YouTube in there. I was 21, cut me some slack. On a typical Tuesday, we had our morning rush and things began to quiet down by around 10 a.m. My desk received a phone call. I was one of the only ones that ever answered the phone. It was easier to make sales and reach my quota that way. I answered the phone with the typical polite greeting. The man on the other line seemed nice. He told me he noticed he was charged an overdraft fee in his account and asked if I could refund it for him. I told him as we've already refunded him several hundred dollars in fees, we will not be doing so again and I will not be able to help him. He began to get angry with me, threatening me, yelling, cussing. I have a strict policy. I'll tolerate three F-bombs before I politely inform them I will not tolerate their behavior anymore, and I'll start to hang up. And yes, it happens often. In finance, the customer is not always right. He threatened to meet me in the parking lot if I didn't refund the fee. I just hung up at that point. I took a break to relax a little after that and I went to my buddy's office to hang out. I noticed the office phones were ringing constantly since my last phone call. Kind of unusual for a Tuesday morning. I noticed one of the tellers was on the phone, and she looked concerned. Then I overheard her saying something similar to what I'd just said on the phone before she hung up. I decided to ask her about it. Seems the same man called again. Then the phone rang once more. Same man. He actually kept calling and calling. Eventually, the manager told us, if we see his caller ID, completely ignore the call. No sense in being harassed by this lunatic. He called us over 150 times in one hour. Eventually, my manager answered the phone. That man was irate. He threatened us more saying he was going to come there and kill all of us. My manager didn't take this lightly. We had to go on lockdown. We were directly next to a school, too, and they had to go on lockdown as well. My manager didn't want to shut business down completely, so he decided two of our more athletic men would guard the doors to let people in, as long as they weren't this man. I was one of the lucky ones. They gave me a photo of his ID, he was bald with a big beard and a heavy set guy in his 20s. His name was Brandon. I sat at the door all morning, letting in all the kind old ladies that were worried we'd been robbed. Meanwhile, the guy kept calling and calling. Our collection team had actually repossessed his vehicle a month earlier as he stopped making payments on it. But we knew he lived close enough to walk. Some employees decided to look at his Facebook page. He had photos posing with guns while wearing bandanas and balaclavas, posing like how you'd imagine a terrorist or bank robber would when trying to be intimidating. I felt pretty scared at this point. I wasn't allowed to carry my own gun to work due to liability reasons, and I felt vulnerable. Another old lady came to the door then. I greeted her and let her in. Behind her came in this clean-shaven and slim man, but he was quite tall. He said to me in a very hushed voice, Hi, I'm Brandon, and you need to take me to your manager's office. I went cold. He was wearing a hoodie 
and had his hands in his pocket. He had bags under his eyes. He looked nothing like how his ID used to look. He shaved and he lost at least 75 pounds. He looked absolutely manic. I froze with fear. I had just opened the door up for the guy that threatened to kill all of us. Quietly, I took him to my manager's office. I gave a subtle nod to a teller. They read my face and body language and hit the panic button under the desk. I brought him into the manager's office. My manager was so scared. This man politely sat down with his hands in his pockets still. The air was cold and I stood standing at the door ready to jump on the guy or run away. I wasn't sure. Before anything else could happen, the police came walking in swiftly but quietly. They approached behind him in the office and quickly subdued him. Turns out, my manager had let the police know the situation beforehand, and they already had cops stationed close by. They pulled a handgun from the man's pocket and arrested him. I looked around at my co-workers, all collectively sighing in relief. Unfortunately, we were not allowed to leave early. In fact, we stayed late that day. We had to give witness statements to the police. I came into work the next day, unplugging my desk phone. Even now, the sound of that ringtone brings me right back to that cloudy Tuesday morning. After this, I took a job underwriting loans, away from the general public. I still have a no F-word policy, by the way. I won't be bullied by these loonies. Fed up with fast food. From Ben T. I've worked at quite a few fast food places in my life. I have a few stories that capture my life from the ages of 14 to 18 years, which bring me anxiety when I look back on them. While they may not seem to be the scariest, I ask that you keep in mind that these occurred when I was young and at my first ever job. With all that in mind, I'll share two of my scariest experiences at my first job. The first job I took was at a national fast food, coffee, breakfast, and donut shop chain. I don't want to say the actual name, but yeah, it's probably the first one that comes to your mind. I was around 14 to 15 years old at the time of these events. That job was a whole horror story on its own. On my first day there, I was in awe. I felt like an adult having my first job and learning faster than most of the other workers there. I was full of hope and excited to see how things would go. I finished my training for the day and went home. The general manager there was an older guy named Gary. Gary had just moved to my area from another state and was hired to manage that store in place of the area manager. The area manager, Anna, was a nightmare. I was scheduled for 40 to 50 hours a week while in high school as well as over the summer. There were days where I'd get off of work and get home and she would call me telling me I should come back to work another shift that very same day, then would get mad when I said no. The first scary story I recall was around 10 p.m. in a crappy part of the city. Being so young, I would have to rely on my parents for transportation. I finished up the closing procedures, then took a seat in the lobby, waiting for my mom to arrive. After a couple of minutes, the shift lead came out and was about to leave for the night too. However, when they saw me there, they seemed annoyed. The shift lead told me they had to lock up. That didn't seem like an issue at first, but what they said next made it a problem. I was informed that the manager wanted to go home for the night, and since they didn't want to wait for me to get picked up or leave me in the store alone, they decided to tell me I had to wait outside the store. I was too nervous to say anything at the time, even though I knew it was ridiculous. So I stepped outside, and I watched the manager's car pull out into the street and start heading away. I sat down on the one table we had outside with my bag, uniform, and my phone. My parents were typically late to get me as they had their own things to take care of that made picking me up harder. I sat down and pulled out my phone to pass the time. It was fairly dark out, 
with no lights on outside or inside. I sat there, feeling out of place, waiting for a pair of lights to pull into the parking lot. Instead of that, a man on a bike pulled into the lot and headed past me towards another store. Thinking nothing of it, I went back to my phone. Soon after that, the bike man came back the same way he came from originally. A bit concerned, but still not thinking too much of it, I put my phone down for a bit to keep waiting. He repeated this process of coming back and forth through the parking lot a few times, getting quicker every time. I began to feel nervous. Eventually, he just started biking around the building going on the drive through path and coming around. I was getting anxious, and I had to admit this behavior seemed off. My hands were sweating, and my heart was beating fast. My phone began to vibrate, and after a brief shock from the sound, I felt relief when my mom said she was less than a minute away. I stayed on the phone with her until I saw her car pull in to the lot, and I practically ran to her. The bike rider sat there looking at me. It was dark, so I couldn't see his face, but I can imagine he wore a scowl. A few days later, I was back at work, and I talked with my younger manager, who was friendly. She told me the area we were in was notorious for drug dealers, and that man likely thought I was either a junkie or another seller. He was probably scoping me out, trying to tell if he should sell me something or rob me. Having a bag with me probably made him think I was selling something, but my collared shirt casted enough doubt for him to wait to try anything. I was in a state of numbness for a bit, but soon stuffed that memory down inside of me with the other dark memories. This second story is scary in a different way. When it was slow, we were supposed to clean, and I had a bit of an obsession of cleaning up anything that looked like it hadn't been cleaned in a while. I was doing my thing when I went over to the ice cream side of the store. We had a little plastic stand for the cake cones and some other things. I was thinking, that hasn't been cleaned since I've been here. I then made my way over to clean it myself. I reached behind to scrub the back when all my muscles tensed up and I experienced what felt like a bunch of spikes being shot through my arm for just a moment. Then the headache started. I grabbed a counter for balance. I was confused and dazed, and just stood there for a second, feeling literally shocked and confused. After a minute or two of regaining my composure, I moved the plastic thing I was cleaning and looked behind it to find a power socket with exposed wires coming out of it. I was mad and concerned, and I went to tell my manager. I took him over and showed him the mess of wires coming out of the socket. All he said was, Oh, yeah, just don't touch that. No crap, Sherlock, I thought. I kept that job for a few more months before quitting. Because my boss got mad, I requested time off more than once for family events. Screw that job, and most of the workers. At least the owner was chill and one of my managers. If they ever hear this and recognize the story, thank you for making that job bearable for me. I drove past his body six times. From Trenchcoat Badger 2020 was a crap show of a year for a lot of reasons, but the lowest points for me or the suicide of one coworker on the 4th of July, and then the death of another on Christmas. It's the latter that haunts me the most. That's what this story is about. For a little context, I live in the inland Pacific Northwest, along a mountain range, so rural areas like mine have a lot of dips and curves along the roads that command a harsh respect from drivers. My boss had decided to take the team to a movie as a Christmas gift, renting a theater for those of us who wanted to show up for a private screening. She'd weaseled it as a team training day, so we were all on the clock for the movie. That's right, we got paid to watch a movie. A few co-workers even pitched in so everyone could buy popcorn, and others bought drinks for one another. It's still one of the best memories with my job, though only a few people from the team at the time still work there. 
Q hadn't made it though, even though he'd texted a coworker he'd be there, and he had been one of the most excited about the whole thing. My shift at the theater went splendidly, of course. On the drive home later that night, after the best shift of my life, I felt an urge to pull over and check the side of the road, going down that curved hill. The roads were slick though, and there wasn't space enough to safely pull my car out of the way of oncoming traffic. So I ignored the feeling and drove past, though the worst feeling of dread washed over me afterwards. Something in me told me I'd made a grave mistake. I brushed the guilt aside, telling myself I was worrying about nothing. I told myself that Q had probably changed his mind, and his phone had probably just run out of battery, so he'd been unable to call. It was just my anxiety, I thought. My drive to work the day after that felt unusually cold, especially on that corner. The chill on that hill on that same curve was something that unsettled me in a way only a few other experiences have. Nonetheless, I made it to work on time and forgot about the corner for the next nine hours. I dreaded that corner on my drive home and again got that chill. This chill in the corner continued the next day, to and from work. The corner carried a weight, a dread. It dipped steeply on one side into the forest, dark and snowy. Only a vehicle that sat high on the road would be able to notice if anyone went off that side. That is, if they dared take their eyes off the road at least. It was the same road that had nearly taken my life once before on another icy corner a few years prior. On the third day, I was stopped on my way to work by a road crew, but as I'd arrived just about the same time as them, they waved me through, faces sad and somber. That chill crept into my body like the plague had in April. Work was calm. That word is a cursed and jinxed word in many professions, I know. I had noted that the coworker who hadn't made the movie hadn't shown up again making it a few days now that he hadn't been heard from. Why I never put that and the chill together before escapes me. Maybe I hadn't wanted to think about losing another coworker, of attending yet another funeral. I was on my lunch break when my boss took a phone call, then came out and sat at my table. This was unusual. Her eyes were heavy and sad. Hey, Badger, she said. The chill from that corner returned to me for a moment, despite the heaters in the lobby being ridiculously warm that day. They, uh, they found Q's car. He went off the road and down into the first dip on that hill by the lake, that one by your place. She was quiet for a moment. The air left my lungs and my heart began sinking. He's dead. Guilt tore at my core like a feral thing. I had driven past that spot at least six times. I hadn't felt right since he hadn't showed up for the movie. I may not have always worked with the man, but I've always seen my coworkers as a family. A dysfunctional one, but a family nonetheless. All that was on my mind was that urge after the shift at the theater. Oh, was all I could manage in a small, defeated voice. My boss and I sat in a heavy silence for a while. By that point in the year, I had already lost some people in my life to COVID, and I'd emotionally shut down months ago from the grief. I spoke up after a moment. Thank you for telling me. She nodded, giving me an awkward pat and squeeze on my shoulder. At a loss for what to do, since I'm not really a hugger, she then headed back to her office. On the drive home that night, there was no chill on the corner anymore. But the guilt welled up so strong, I threw up when I got home. No more than a few minutes after rounding that corner, I soon cried on the bathroom floor. There were a couple of odd things that happened at work after that. Just little things like the paint scrapers being hidden, scrubbers by the sink outright vanishing, bags falling down without good reason, Timers going off without being set. But all of this settled after Q's funeral, which I didn't attend, though my boss and a few other co-workers had. 
I don't know that these little work pranks were cue, but it wouldn't surprise me if he just wanted to get a few last jokes in before he was laid to rest. I still drive by that corner to this day, and even in the wildfire heat of summer, it sends chills down my spine from time to time. Some of the brush has been trimmed back since then too, but it only reminds me that I unknowingly drove past Q so many times. Just keep in mind, buckle up and go slow when it's icy, slow down and please drive safe. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com.